Yeah. I think we'll get started. How is everyone? Good, thank you. Well. I'm doing well. Um, so just as a reminder, and maybe for those of you who haven't been with us before, the seminar series, this is the Human Wildlife Interaction Seminar Series, and this is actually the third seminar of this semester. And the way this started off last year was actually a collaboration between the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department and the Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Department. And the idea was to bring in speakers um, from different areas that could talk about human-wildlife relationships and interactions, and hopefully at the same time spark ideas for collaboration among the different programs in the college and beyond. Um, so I'm really pleased today that we have Peter David from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And he's going to be talking to us largely about human-wolf relationships. Um, but I did learn an interesting factoid about Peter in terms of where his career started. He actually was selling hot dogs at Packers games. So that's where it all started for him. But on the conservation side, um, he has bachelor's and master's degrees in wildlife ecology from University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he's been working for the Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission for over 30 years now, right? Yep. Um, and so this commission represents 11 member Ojibwe tribes um, covering areas of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. And so he's learned over the years, in addition to his formal education, a lot from the elders and the different tribal members he's worked with. And I also want to introduce briefly Lisa David, his wife, who's also with the biological division of the commission. And it's really a pleasure for us to have these folks here today. Um, and for them to make time to talk to us about their experiences with wolves and other wildlife working with the native tribes. So, yeah, I'll turn it over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and, and an honor to be invited. Uh, and appreciate all of you taking an hour of this uh, sunny day to come here and listen to this. Um, I always start off with a bunch of caveats about things. Uh, and the first one I think i got to hit right out of the box is I'm going to be talking about, about the Ojibwe's relationship with Mayangan or wolves. Okay, Ojibwe, also Chippewa, Anishinaabe, three different names for the same group of people. But I'm not Ojibwe, okay? And so, you know, that might have a, you know, a sense of uh, cultural appropriation to be talking about this. I can only say I've been hired by the tribes to work on their behalf on, on wolf and other issues and uh, been privileged to do that now for over 30 years. Um, so, but much of the story or the things that I'll try to talk about today, certainly uh, I owe to the tribal members and to the elders who taught me much of this. So I want to recognize them right out of the, right out of the box, uh, but also note that any failures in telling this story are strictly my own. Um, one other thing I guess I always have to say too is, you know, people talk about, well, how do the tribes feel about this? You know, I'm doing a disservice if I give an impression that there is a tribal perspective. Tribal members have a wide range of views towards wolves, just like people in the non-tribal community too. And the Ojibwe bands that I happen to work with, you know, may have a very different perspective than other tribes, including ones, you know, in this region. So I don't want to, I don't want to uh, ever give the impression that there's sort of one perspective, but there is uh, sort of collectively, the Ojibwe have a perception or a relationship with wolves that's pretty unique and tends to be highly protective of wolves. And I'll explain why that is in a minute. So recognizing that, that this is about generalities, um, I want to start right off by saying, you know, it's no surprise to anybody that, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of people who don't hold wolves in very high esteem. You know, my ancestors were European tends to be very negative portrayals of wolves in your, much of European culture. Um, it's hard to find very positives, you know, it's from as far as wolfing down your food or, you know, the wolf whistle and everything else. There's also, of course, many people who sort of put wolves on a pedestal. Uh, and they really, I think, give them a lot of, um, a lot of baggage in some ways, you know, to make them representative of nature and wilderness and all that is, all that is good in nature. One of the points I hope I'll be making by the time I'm done is that the Ojibwe perspective is actually, I think, in between the two of these. It's a more moderate position, actually. Wolves aren't something to crush into your heel. They're not something to put up on a pedestal. They're side by side with you. 
And, you know, in the wolf world, that's actually a little bit of a moderate position. I'm not sure if people are familiar at all, but you really can't talk about the Ojibwe's relationship with Mayingan without going all the way to the beginning, which is the tribe's creation story. And if you're not familiar with that, I'll try to do a very brief recap of it. It's a little bit like the story that I grew up with, a, a biblical version of creation, in that there's sort of a sequence to creation that takes place. In the Ojibwe worldview, the first order of creation were all the physical things, the earth, the air, the sun, the water. The second layer of creation were all the plant beings. The third layer were all of the, all of the animal beings, the four-legged, the crawling, the swimming, the winged, all of the animals. And then finally, in the fourth layer of creation comes original man, single individual lowered down to the planet. So similar to the biblical story, humans are the last here as well. But the, the, the two tellings really depart wildly at that point. Because in the Bible, you then go on to be told that, you know, humans are really the most important thing. You're supposed to have dominion over the rest of creation. Uh, and you're supposed to subdue the earth. The Ojibwe take it exactly opposite. Humans were last because we're the least important. Okay? We had to be last because we were dependent upon all the other parts of creation for our own survival. So we're supposed to be humble and accept that role as our appropriate place. Now, original man was given the task of going out and naming all of the beings. And as he did that, he recognized that a lot of things came in pairs. And he was alone and had a loneliness of spirit. And so he talked to the creator about that. And interestingly, the creator responded by providing a wolf as a partner to walk and to talk and to play with. And now the creator said, go out and visit all of the world's places together. And so this is, uh, you know, the tongue in cheek is this is the original road trip, right? If you don't know somebody real well, spend a lot of time traveling together and you probably will by the time you're done. And so they traveled all the, all the parts of the earth and they saw all of the beauty in creation. They say, uh, saw all of the relationships that existed, the interrelationships between the different orders of creation. And they also saw the very unique relationship that they had with each other really as brothers. They came to be as brothers, okay? So they must have been very surprised when they went back to the Creator and said, okay, we've done that task, now what? And the Creator said, you actually have to go your own ways, okay? Each have to take your separate path, but what's gonna happen to one of you is gonna happen to the other, okay? And if you don't remember anything else that I tell you in the rest of this time, remember that, because that's the, that's the linchpin, really, that under, lies all of the other things that I'm going to talk about is this understanding and belief that you have intertwined fates. Now, when you say the term treaties, treaties are the supreme law of the land. When you say treaties, most people think of these kinds of things. This is northern Wisconsin. These are some of the different land cessation treaties that took place with the Ojibwe, in this case, the Ojibwe, ceded lands to the United States government. Okay. But tribal members would tell you that these, these are not the old treaties. Okay, these, were in 18, these two treaties, particularly in northern Wisconsin, 1837, 1842, took place. These are newbies by the Ojibwe's perspective. The original treaties were made with the other beings. Okay? What the Ojibwe really referred to as the more than human beings, because again, they came first and they have more significance. Those other beings recognized this pitiful human and agreed to provide for them, okay? And so the tribes made treaties with the wolf and with the deer and with the wild rice. And certainly when it came to wolf, it was this brotherhood relationship that again was the underpinning for what that treaty was. Like any treaty, there were sort of responsibilities on both sides. Wolves more than anything else were educators. You know, they taught the Ojibwe how to survive on this relatively harsh landscape. They were oftentimes hunting the same prey, how to have stamina, how to persevere, um, how to raise your young and extended family groups. And that's something you still see very strongly in tribal communities, the roles of the aunties and uncles in raising young. Wolves also help keep the deer herd healthy. And by doing that, they also help protect some of the populations of important medicinal plants. 
The Ojibwe, again, it goes back to recognizing the wolf as a brother. Treat them with respect. Think of their best interests. And again, to be appreciative and humble in accepting the gifts that actually wolves provide in this treaty. So what I want to tell you now is a brief, a lot of this is, is Wisconsin based, okay? This is a different landscape and a different place, but I hope it adds another way maybe to, to look at the issues that you're considering here in Colorado. I want to tell you about the history of wolves in Wisconsin, and I think it depicts um, sort of a contemporary telling of this intertwined fates because I'm going to compare it to the recovery or the restoration of the tribe's off-reservation treaty rights in Wisconsin. So if you go back far enough, around 1800 maybe or so, it's thought that Wisconsin probably supported a population of about 3,000 to 5,000 wolves, okay? In the area that was to become Wisconsin, essentially north, south, east, to west, was all suitable wolf habitat. I didn't really put that on the graph here just so you can kind of see the rest of the story in a little bit more detail. Again, these treaties around 1837 or 1842 is when the Ojibwe ceded these lands that they were occupying to the United States government. And it wasn't long after that, about 18, 1848, that the state of Wisconsin was actually formed. And about 100 years after the Wisconsin became a state, the Mayangan population was thought to number about 50 animals. And if you go just a little bit beyond that, by 1960, this happens to be one year after I was born into Green Bay, and if there are any Packer fans in the house, one year after Vince Lombardi came to Green Bay, <laughs> Wisconsin was wolfless, okay? It had been totally extirpated from the state. The Ojibwe's brother was gone, okay? And of course, why did this happen? Well, we know, well, this picture isn't from Wisconsin, but you know, one of the first things most states did when they were established was develop bounty programs. And wolves were very heavily persecuted. Everybody knows this history. And it didn't take place clearly just in Wisconsin, but across the, the country, you know. It turns out, for all of the mystic m myths around wolves, you know, the, the cunning lobo and all of that stuff, wolves are actually quite easy to kill. Okay, they were easy to kill then. Huge parts of the lower 48, you know, they were extirpated from all of it except for this population in northern Minnesota. And it's worth remembering that they're even easier to kill today than they were then. In 1974, things kind of got interesting. Two invisible political boundaries were crossed. One of the crossings was made by these two fellows. Mike and Fred Tribble. Okay, these are two tribal members from the Lakota Ray Reservation near Hayward, Wisconsin. This happened when they were younger. They look like hellions, don't they? So they, they were taking a class at St. Scholastic College up in Duluth on Indian, uh, Indian law. And they read this language straight out of the treaty. This is straight out of the Treaty of 1837. It says, the privilege of hunting, fishing, and gathering the wild rice upon the lands, the rivers, the lakes included in this territory ceded is guaranteed to the Indians during the pleasure of the President of the United States. So they, they talked to their instructor about that and they said, yeah, did, the, did the President ever lose his pleasure about this? And they said, no. They said, well then how come, how come we can't do this? How come if I go off the reservation to hunt, I have to have a state license, follow state rules and all this stuff when we reserve this in a treaty? And uh, the instructor said, well, you need a test case. I go, what do you mean? He said, well, somebody's got to get busted for this. So these two brothers decided to go fishing on the wrong side of a lake. Okay, there's a lake on the reservation. Part of the lake was on the reservation. Part of the lake was off. They decided to go fishing across that invisible boundary on the part of the lake that was off the reservation. And they took a fish. Okay. That fish may have been swimming on the reservation side 10 minutes earlier, I don't know. Didn't matter much probably to the fish where these fellows were, but it mattered a lot to the Wisconsin DNR wardens who came and arrested them. They weren't surprised because they had told the warden ahead of time they were going to be out there. They wanted a test case. And it was this little act actually that led many, many years later to the reaffirmation of the off-reservation treaty rights. It was that same year not impossibly the same day, 
that another invisible boundary was crossed and wolves that had been in northern Minnesota crossed the boundary into the state of Wisconsin and took up residence in northwest Wisconsin and began a tenuous time there. Uh, they would have a new chance. This is just a year after the Endangered Species Act was passed, so there'd be new protections on wolves. Maybe, you know, the, the uh, bounties are now about 15 years and behind us. Maybe something's going to be different this time. I think it's really th interesting when you think about intertwined, intertwined fates to think, first of all, about the motivation of both of these acts, okay? I think for both the Tribble Brothers and for the Mayangan, it was an effort to improve your status, you know, and to create perhaps a better opportunity for the generations that were going to follow you. What's also interesting is that a lot of people looked at these two things very similarly and responded to them very similarly. There was, there was when you talk about really the non-Indian community now, there's some people who saw both of these things as restoration, right? Wolves were coming back. A part of the landscape that had existed in Wisconsin was coming back. This is recovery and restoration. And tribal members were recovering some of their traditions and the opportunity to practice certain things that they had. At the same time, there were large components of the general public that saw both of these things in a very negative light, okay? We all know how people feel about wolves, right? They're gonna come in here, they're gonna wipe out the deer herd, for example. And the tribes, exercising their off-reservation harvest rights, were gonna have negative impacts on the natural resources of the state as well. And there was a great deal of opposition to this, as you'll see in a minute. So what happened? Well, I think I may have skipped. Initially here, for quite a number of years, the wolf population struggled to do much of anything at all. If you can see it on the bottom, it just basically puttered along without making much of a change at all. And despite the fact that wolves were protected by the Endangered Species Act, the leading cause of death was gunshot wounds. The tribes at this time were struggling as well. There was huge pushback against early efforts to exercise their off-reservation harvesting rights. These rights, the opposition really peaked in 1989. And the governor, Governor Tommy Thompson at that time, actually went to the federal courts to try to seek an injunction against the tribes exercising their rights, kind of under the excuse of, we can't guarantee their protection. So, because there's these violent protesters out there. Um, and it was ugly. It was ugly. I, as a native Wisconsinite, I was not at all proud of my state and the racism that overtly came to the surface at this time, you know. Fortunately, the gunshots that were going off at landings were aimed over people's heads. Pipe bombs were found before they exploded. But this was a, this was a dark period. The federal judge, Barbara Crabb, ruled to say that if this court holds that violent and lawless protests can determine the rights of the citizens, what message is that gonna send, right? It's just gonna encourage people to be lawless. Notably, she did not say that there were very fine people on both sides. This was a dark period for another important Wisconsin industry, brewing. Uh, this little brew came out at this time to raise money for the anti-treaty protesting groups, okay? Treaty beer, buy this and, and your money would go to fight the tribes and their treaty rights. Just to show you how wrong these folks got it, that's actually the only fish that was ever speared from below. Okay. So, one big point came with the Lac de Flambeau tribe rejected a buyout. When the tribes first started exercising some of these rights off reservation, a lot of people kind of said, you know, we know you're kind of talking about traditional practices and things, but a lot of people believe that what the tribes really were doing was upping the ante for an eventual buyout from the state of Wisconsin. And in fact, eventually the state came up with quite a lucrative offer to the Lac de Flambeau tribe. Most of the protests came around this practice of spearing fish in the spring, the walleye fishery in particular. The name, the Lac de Flambeau tribe, comes from this. These, the name comes from, it's the lake of the torches, the torches that they would hold at night while they were harvesting fish this way. They are the most active tribe to exercise the fishing rights and uh, this offer was, was 
quite rich by tribal standards. And it even included things like per capita payments to every tribal member. That was sort of, I think, a, you know, a, a, a move by the state who recognized that really a small percentage of the tribe actually actively harvests this way. And it was a huge thing, actually, when in a tribal referendum they rejected this buyout offer from the state. And I think it made a lot of people realize that the tribes were really serious about recovering uh, some of their traditional practices. Eventually, the wolf population took this turn and started upticking substantially. And coincidentally or not, the tribes were having more success in the federal court cases at this point. In 1991, this is commonly called either the LCO or the Voigt case, was the treaty right reaffirmation case. 1991, when that final verdict was reached, the population was still only 40 animals in Wisconsin. This went all the way to the Supreme Court eventually. In 1999, by that time, the wolf population had reached 200 animals. And it seemed to really hit an inflection point and showed rapid growth after that. And so by 2012, about two decades after the treaty rights were first reaffirmed, Wisconsin population of wolves was up to about 850 animals. And wolves were taken off the endangered species list. So what happened then? Well, the very day that wolves came off the endangered species list, legislation was introduced into Wisconsin to have a hunting and trapping season. Okay, this was not pushed really by the state DNR. This was crafted by certain special interest groups working with their legislators. The big one in Wisconsin really is the Bear Hunting Association. <laughs> Happens to be a very, very influential group and did much to shape this legislation. One thing about coming off the endangered species list, so now we had legislation for hunting and trapping season. The second thing is it also made it possible to do lethal depredation control on wolves that were attacking livestock or pets. So you really had two new forms of mortality added onto the wolf population. And I know there's a lot of numbers in here, uh, but we had hunting and trapping seasons for three years and fairly remarkable over that time period, there were over 800 known mortalities of wolves in the state. The vast majority, over 500 and a quarter, coming from recreational harvest, hunting or trapping, especially trapping it turns out, about 164 under depredation control and then over about 125 through other things like car accidents, um, wolf on wolf mortality, diseases and those sorts of things. So pretty, pretty significant numbers. You can see the quote has changed over time here, the three years. But amazing to me that no one mortalities in that one year, it took the Wisconsin population 30 years to reach 360 animals, which is the number that were killed in 2013 or died of natural causes. So really substantial change of the landscape. The population, that first year, growth stopped. The second year, it actually showed a pretty marked decline for the first time in a number of years. And the third year, when the state backed off the quotas a little bit, the wolf showed some population recovery. The tribes, incidentally, could have legally harvested wolves during this period, but for both cultural and educational, or both cultural and ecological reasons, opted not to do that and did not harvest any wolves. Then what happened, there was a successful legal challenge that put uh, this Western Great Lakes wolf distinct population unit back on the endangered species list. And since then, the wolf population, it grew for about three years. And now for the last three years, it is essentially plateaued, it appears like. And it looks like we might be at carrying capacity in Wisconsin. Now, this, I can't really get into, well, I'll say this is a pretty significant number now about 950 wolves, certainly, certainly significant compared to what we had in 1960, but still probably no more than a third of the number of wolves that once lived in Wisconsin. And also just as sort of a, a comparison, compared to some other things like black bears, Wisconsin has a high bear population, probably between 25 and 30,000 bears in Wisconsin. So still a relatively small number of animals, depending on how you look at it. I can't get into a, a deep discussion about the merits of delisting 
Um, but I did want to point out, this is, those three years that seasons took place, this is the area that the feds had delisted wolves in, the Western Great Lakes distinct population segment. And the, the crosshash area is the area that wolves actually occupied, and then the bigger boundary is the entire area that was delisted. I'll say from my perspective, you know, you hear a lot about uh, political gerrymandering these days. I think this was sort of a case of biological gerrymandering, okay? There were no wolves, for example, in the entire lower peninsula of Michigan, and yet that area was delisted. And so the, the service really did here was tried to find a way to make sure that these three states that had wolves in them didn't have a line running through them, okay? Um, so that the entire state could sort of have one wolf status in it. That was less important for these other states that are bisected because those states essentially didn't have any wolves. And I think probably many people in the room are aware that currently Fish and Wildlife Service is considering delisting wolves again. So last time, based on that population, the crosshatched area, they delisted that space. This time, based really largely on that same population in the upper Midwest, they're proposing to delist wolves from Maine to California, okay? And if you read that most recent delisting proposal, what it really says is that in their interpretation, that if there's one population that's really secure and isn't gonna go extinct, then wolves shouldn't be listed as an endangered species. And it doesn't really address sort of the historic range question. I can tell you that the Ojibwe certainly are glad that wolves have recovered where they did, but their relationship and their concern for their brother doesn't end at the Cedar Territory line, okay? And our tribes are on record opposing this delisting proposal in part because there's places like Colorado that have suitable wolf habitat where recovery hasn't taken place yet. I wanna talk a little bit about goals. Uh, this kind of a goal, a recovery goal from the Endangered Species Act are the kind of goals that you sometimes see in state wolf management plans. Aren't the kind of goals that you have for your brother or for uh, a being with whom you see your fate intertwined. So Wisconsin right now, on paper, has a population goal of 350 animals, okay? I don't know a biologist today, I guess, knowing what we know today, who thinks that that's actually a very good population goal biologically for the state. But that goal goes back to 1999. That's when the existing Wisconsin plan was written. And at that time, there were only about 200 wolves in the state. And there really wasn't anybody alive who had any idea what it was gonna be like to have 300 or 400 wolves on the landscape because we hadn't seen that. And so the state went through this process and trying to, you know, how we, what are we gonna come up with as a goal? And they said, well, the goal, the bottom end can't really be anything lower than the federal delisting goal. The higher end, you know, could theoretically be as high as K or carrying capacity. But interestingly, most of the estimates we had of carrying capacity at that time suggested that carrying capacity in Wisconsin might be about 500. Turns out that wasn't a very good guess, you know. So, but anyway, between that number, maybe between 500 and the lower limit, what are we gonna pick and what are we gonna base it on? And they took, I think, an interesting criteria. And if you read the state plan, it says the advisory committee settled on this number of 350 as a reasonable first attempt at social tolerance. Okay, first of all, I can tell you that we knew even less about social tolerance than we did about carrying capacity. We had no idea. There, there's really no database to go to and say, what, how does the public feel about this? All the committee really knew is that there were some special interest groups in the state that would have, you know, if they had their way, they'd really not, rather not have any wolves here at all, okay? But can you imagine being an Ojibwe person and reading that the species with whom your fate is tied to is gonna be determined by how much people like you, okay? This is flashback time for the tribes, okay? The same thing that Judge Barbara Crabb warned us about on a social issue was sort of acceptable here on a biological scale. I wanna talk a little bit about, about hunting and trapping. I don't include a picture of this because it's very offensive to tribal members oftentimes to see the kind of pictures you see of people 
with their, with their uh, trophy. Um, I want to talk about this in part because we have a federal delisting proposal out there on the landscape and Wisconsin still has a law in the books that says if wolves aren't on the endangered species list, we're hunting them. Uh, I do want to make clear I'm not talking about lethal depredation control. Okay, I'm talking about a general recreational type harvest here. The tribes struggled with lethal depredation control, but ultimately our member tribes came to the decision that they were not opposed to the judicial application of lethal control when verification was high um, and when non-lethal options weren't available or effective. So Ojibwe's are hunters, clearly. Make no, no mistake about that, okay? But the moral underpinning for, for hunting to a traditional Ojibwe person is need. Okay, you have to need what you take and you only take what you need. The other thing is, is really taking is probably not even the right word here, okay? When you harvest a deer, and again, that's not the right word, but you're with, the interchange that's really happening here is that this more than human being is fulfilling its part of the treaty. It's providing for the pitiful human being. That animal's giving itself to you rather than you taking it. So how does that contrast sort of with some of the, the needs we sometimes hear given for having a hunting season? I call these the four horsemen of the wolf apocalypse, okay? And you've probably heard all of these same arguments here. The things that oftentimes come up is the human safety issue, you know, wolves are dangerous. The impacts, in Wisconsin, it's the deer herd, and it's gonna be expanded to other ungulates here, I'm sure. That it, we're gonna have wolves everywhere if we, don't, if we don't limit their population. And then this, this depredations issue. So, if you think about these, it, at all, really, all of these basically are rooted in the old idea that every wolf is a problem wolf, okay? Or the only good wolf is a dead wolf, okay? Maybe the modern version of that is the only good wolf is uh, the one that keeps you off the endangered species list so that you can maybe go after the rest of them. It's not saying that we hunt wolves because we need them or we need some gift they provide. We're hunting them because we need them dead. <coughs> to the tribes, this, this, believe it or not, it, this sounds almost like, like ethnic cleansing, okay? A very small number of wolves are ever involved in human safety issues, right? So why would you punish the entire population of wolves? And that's really what this is. Most of these issues, they're not talking about sort of a sustainable harvest, that they're really talking about hunting as a euphemism here. They're talking about population reduction, okay? Maybe taking that Wisconsin population on 150 and bringing it down to 350. No reason for, to do that based on human safety because wolves we know present very little risk. You know, the, uh, the impacts on depredations are maybe a little more justifiable. About 12 or 13% on average of Wisconsin wolf packs are involved in livestock depredations. But you don't necessarily, again, punish the entire population in order to address that issue. The wolves everywhere issue, we, we know biologically is nonsense. Wolves are highly territorial. They're very good at limiting their own numbers. And in my part of the world, Minnesota population has stopped growing. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan population has stopped growing and it looked like Wisconsin is probably on the verge of stopping growing, right? Tribes might also say, you know, this is a little, uh, a little hypocritical to be pointing at wolves here because in the time that the wolf population increased by this massive nearly 1,000 animals, the population in Wisconsin of humans increased by 1.3 million people. Okay. One of those things is having an impact for sure. I separate the deer herd out a little bit because at least every wolf eats deer in Wisconsin. Okay. But from the tribal perspective, that's also based on need. Okay, wolves are taking what they need to survive so that they can fulfill their responsibilities under those treaties. From the tribal perspective, and believe me, our tribal hunters love deer, but they see this impact on the deer herd as sort of more like an orchard keeper pruning his trees. It's keeping the herd healthy. It's not devastating deer numbers. 
This, and this is, uh, you know, some of the, if you want a little bit of hard data in here, this is an old document put out by the Wisconsin DNR um, that kind of compares some of the impact of various things on the deer herd. It was out of date. This was back when there were about 650 wolves. So now there's the total harvested deer in Wisconsin is probably about 20,000. Uh, but there have been some other changes. As wolf populations go up, coyote numbers tend to be pushed downward a little bit. So that takes probably least lower. Bobcat numbers are up a little bit. Vehicle kills are probably up a little bit. The bottom line is when you look at all of this and you put it all in the, you know, together, there's just not strong evidence to suggest that wolves are driving deer numbers. You know, nobody blames car kills for having this huge impact on the deer herd or human hunters. Wolves very oftentimes get the finger pointed at them. And that's someplace, again, when you think about intertwined fates that I think the tribes have this real sympathy with because the tribes often have the fingers pointed at them as well. You know, if the fishing isn't great in your lake, might not, it's probably not the sport of harvest, it's probably not climate change or invasive species or water quality. It's probably that tribal spearing that's the issue. And it's oftentimes based on less data than this. Now, there is one place where wolves can have a devastating impact sometimes. And really, nobody talks about it, but it's, it's the world of art. I think... Uh, <laughs> We can all agree this has to end. I'm sorry, I apologize to anybody who has one of these over there. <laughs> but I do want to talk before I wrap up a little bit about the North American model of conservation. And want to talk, I'm not going to get into this in a lot of depth, but trying to view it a little bit again from maybe an Ojibwe perspective. And if people are familiar with this, and I'll, I'll show you the basic tenets of it in a, in a minute. But this is, you know, in much of the wildlife world, um, the North American model is, is the best thing out there, right? This is the way we take care of those species so that we have abundant populations. And you'd probably never, the people who really tout this thing probably never describe it this way, but it's almost like a treaty with wildlife, okay? Uh, you don't have a treaty with something you actually have dominion over. Well, when you think about it, it's really kind of the same thing. It's like, how are we gonna look at wildlife? How are we gonna treat them? And if we do those things in the right way, then the wildlife responds by giving back to us, okay? Now, the Ojibwe's, but well, where do I start on this? <laughs> First thing I have to say, this is an arrogant title, okay? The North American model of conservation. And it was so named because it was different from the model of conservation in Europe where most wildlife was looked as a private resource. But this sort of suggests again that, you know, gee, there was no model of conservation in North America until Europeans showed up here. In fact, I think at least three of these four points or so were probably very heavily influenced by the way Native Americans looked at natural resources and how that differed from the way it operated in Europe. For so example, in, in Europe, the idea was that, you know, landowners owned the wildlife. You get over here to the United States, and really the Native American perspective was nobody owns wildlife. I don't think, I don't think the, the early, uh, you know, the, the early migrants to this country could get away from the idea of ownership. Somebody's got to own it, right? We have dominion over this thing. Somebody has to own it. So let's say everybody owns it. But I think that was actually something that was probably influenced by the way the tribes looked at resources. Um, I, could also get into the arguments how this isn't really a general model of conservation, although it is sometimes applied to non-game things, it's pretty rare. Um, and if it really was a general model of conservation, it ought to be applicable to wolves. And, and people don't use it that way or talk about it that way. In fact, they might use this as, a, as an argument against wolf populations in some ways. I do wanna also point out to this one topic here though, this, even under this model, wildlife can only be killed for a legitimate purpose. I think that too is probably a slightly watered down version of need. You have to, you know, you only harvest for a good moral reason. And I think the tribes would argue uh, that from their perspective, we still don't have a clear legitimate reason for harvesting wolves. Again, that's not to say there might not be a need at times to address individual problem wolves, but that's different than a general recreation or sporting season. 
I'll wrap this up here pretty quick, but I do want to just re, you know, iterate again that from the travel perspective, wolves are their brother. And you know, they see them as having very unique ecological and biological traits. They see them as important to the ecosystem health. They see them, you know, we have issues here. I know chronic wasting disease, uh, I guess I'm in the motherland here, um, but we certainly have it in Wisconsin too. Uh, but much less of it in the northern part of the state where we have strong wolf populations. Whether that's coincidence right now or not, we don't know, but there's strong reasons to think that these might be quite effective in helping us deal with chronic wasting disease. You can get into modeling that's been done to suggest Lyme disease, which is, Wisconsin is certainly a hot spot for that. There's also the, the basic cultural significance, this intrinsic value of wolves, okay, that the tribes feel really strongly about. And, you know, when you're outside of a culture, you kind of look at that and maybe think it looks a little bit quaint. But, you know, our own culture does this all the time, too, okay? When bald eagles came off the endangered species list, they were immediately protected by the Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Not because there's anything about those things that's so unique biologically that they needed a special law. We value them culturally. They have significance, you know. There's a symbol of our country, so we're going to protect them. And the tribes think very strongly about that when they're talking about Mayangan. And then this last one, these question marks, is not really a catch-all. That's actually sort of an important point here. And it goes back to that, that thing of remembering that we, we're supposed to be humble here and remember, remember that. We know more about wolves than we knew 20 years ago. We're going to know more about wolves 20 years from now. We're certainly going to know more about them seven generations from now. And that seven generation is the point that Ojibwe people are supposed to think about when they're making decisions today. Hopefully, if we make good decisions today, people seven generations from now are going to be able to look back and see that we were thinking about them and their interests. Okay? There may be really good reasons for protecting wolves that we just don't even know right now. And we need to be humble enough to remember that. I'd also say that that's actually a topic that, that's really close to an idea that a, a non-tribal person who's got some renown in this field, but you know, when Eldo Leopold talks about intelligent tinkering and keeping every wheel and cog, I think that's the same idea. And that's certainly not the only time that I've noticed sort of this uh, parallel development between Leopold's thinking and some Ojibwe perspectives, uh, but that'll be a topic for another day. So, what does the future hold? Um, I'm optimistic in many ways. Certainly in, in the Midwest, we're in far better shape than we were not very long ago. Um, but I think it's really clear. In the lower 48, or any place really where there's high human density present, the future for wolves is entirely up to us. Okay? We eradicated them once, we could do that again if we decide to do that. We could also decide to leave wolves on a few postage stamps of land, kind of the way reservations, frankly, act for the tribes in many ways. We could have a few populations in spots so that we can feel like we're doing something noble. Or we can really welcome wolves as legitimate beings on the landscape and care for them so that they can care for us, the way it's envisioned in the Ojibwe Treaty with Mayingan. So in short, I think, the future for wolves is entirely up to us. History tells us that. And the Ojibwe tell us that our future is tied to that of wolves. So the circle's complete, and I'll quit there. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take a stab at it. Questions if anybody has any. I have a question. Um, and this question came up at the conference that we were talking about of pathways. Um, one of the questions that came up is why in, in the Midwest, what, what happens in terms of migration from the zone where they're at now? Like, can, is there suitable habitat where they could migrate from where they are? Well, why haven't they gone further out, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I think, I think probably they have largely saturated the suitable habitat. There's, my, my, first of all, my response to that is wolves can live basically any place 
that there's enough food to eat and they aren't persecuted by people. That, that's probably enough of the definition of suitable habitat. But those other parts of the state are just so developed, they have so many people on them, that just things like car accidents and things, and the, and the fragmentation of the land base uh, is gonna probably curtail them. And that's why probably the population has stopped growing in, in Minnesota. Uh, there are places, you know, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan has some suitable habitat, but you've got, you've got a significant barrier in the Great Lakes that maybe if you get enough of an ice bridge, you might get animals to cross, but but there's suitable habitat there, but it's going to be hard to get to. Um, but I don't think you'd see, you're not going to see a lot more wolves. There's probably in the, the driftless area of southwest Wisconsin could probably support a few wolves. But they do tend, you know, that it's just a gauntlet when you get down there. People, for one thing, people don't expect wolves as much, so there's a lot of coyote hunting going on, that kind of thing. So some of those wolves get, get shot still today, you know, um, when they cross over. Not, not always, you know intentionally by any means so are there stories though of them wandering into urban areas or do those stories ever come up um they certainly wander they tend not to go to urban areas a whole lot but they definitely wander and, and wolves i mean yeah it's amazing now uh you know with satellite collars the stories that we never used to get that you can get now of wolves wandering just substantial and even within that area that they recovered, you know, to move from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan into Minnesota and, and make these, these big strikeouts. Um, so they definitely will move, but, but it's, uh, it's hard to find success in many of those other places. And you think about how long it took that Wisconsin population to get traction. And that's, you know, you're almost trying to repeat that in some other places that really have less suitable habitat. So. Have non-lethal measures ever been tested for depredation? And if so, what, what is a wolf's reaction to that? Boy, we got an expert in the back of the room on non-lethal. Uh, I'll say my response in Wisconsin is it's, it's pretty limited. There, they, I think there are situations where it can be effective. And it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, some of them involve a big investment if you're talking about guard animals, guard dogs, those kinds of things. Even flattery can work, you know, but it tends to work on piecemeal pieces. You can't do large areas or do it necessarily for a long time. Jason, do you want to add your thoughts on that question? I think you're better equipped than I am to answer it. You know, non-lethal is a great tool. It's part of an integrated uh, damage management approach. And every situation is different. It depends on seasonality, depends on the type of livestock. Uh, it's kind of like guard dogs. There's different types of guard dogs that are effective. Uh, the traditional uh, white guard dogs that are used for coyotes aren't as effective on wolf because they're too small and wolf packs will kill them. But there's European dogs that are being brought into the United States in uh, wolf and grizzly bear areas that are more effective, the Kangles and some of the others. But then you end up with what type of livestock are you protecting? If you see sheep, sheep are when a band of sheep is a, a normal herd and that's about a thousand animals if you watch sheep move across the landscape they're together if you look at cattle 300 animals they're spread out for miles guard dogs don't work as effectively on cattle as they do on sheep the answer is it depends and so yes it can be very effective to utilize um, non-lethal but there's a timing and the person that is recommending it needs to know the husbandry practices, the livestock they're protecting, the time of year, the local populations, and the habitat that's involved. And it's probably different in Wisconsin than out here, just because animal husbandry is so different. Yeah. You know, you know I, in the western states, we have a bigger issue with uh, the rangelands, large rangelands, um, because of habitat. Um, the, the number of cattle that can be grazed per acre in the western states is significantly different in the upper Midwest. You know, so flattery can be a lot more effective uh, in the upper Midwest, and it is. It's still used in the western states too, um, but that's a piece of it as well, is, is the type of pasture land that the livestock are on. But every situation is different, and it can certainly be utilized as an integrated approach very effectively. You know, I'd say in Wisconsin, we, there, there's a lot of pushback from the egg industry, you know. Um, but, and if you're, losing, if you're losing calves, one or two, yourself, it's an issue for you definitely to deal with. 
In Wisconsin, at least on an industry level, this is really not a terribly big issue. Um, it, you know, we, we don't have wolves throughout the whole state, so I haven't been able to find exact apples to apples comparisons. If, if cattle cross the state, we have wolves in about a third of the state, but the number of cattle that are killed or maimed by wolves in Wisconsin in a typical year is about comparable to the number that go to slaughter every 30 minutes. So now, again, if it's your cattle, it's an issue. But, but if you went up to the cattle industry and said, I have half a million dollars to improve your herd husbandry, they're not going to deal with this issue. They're going to deal with other bigger things. Um, I have a question. Were um, tribes involved in any way in the wolf recovery effort in these states? Were they given a seat at the table, an opportunity to? Uh, you know, it's uh, a good question. So first of all, the recovery itself really took place without human intervention. The wolves did it. Uh, although it was facilitated, obviously, by things like the Endangered Species Act. Then when Wisconsin, or when, when wolves came off the endangered species list, yeah, what role did the tribes have? The tribes, I think, would say very little. They weren't listened to very much. They were opposed to, to, to the hunting seasons in the state. The state said, tough, basically, you know. They actually, in the beginning, uh, said, well, we'll reserve part of the harvest quota for you. And the tribe said, we're not taking that. Uh, and so after a couple of years or two, they stopped doing that. Um, but but it's, it's kind of an interesting situation because for these other things like deer that were on the landscape at the time of the reaffirmation of the treaty rights, we worked really closely with the state to sort of come out with these stipulations on, on management and, and found common ground on a lot of things. Um, but wolves, there were only a couple wolves in the state at that time. And so they weren't really addressed at that time. And now the, the tribes don't have a big, they don't have a strong foothold. They, we argue that there's, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the federal government still has a responsibility to the tribes, whether wolves are on the endangered species list or not. Um, but the service response oftentimes has been, boy, once, once they're off, they're, this, they're a state issue, not a federal one. Yes. So how have the attitudes of the different groups, the hunters, the ranchers, the general public change now that we're Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. The, uh, under the, the previous administration of Wisconsin, the Walker administration, um, a, it actually a very, Wisconsin DNR did a very good social survey about attitudes in the state. High, you know, high sampling rates. They looked at people in wolf range, outside of wolf range, hunting groups, non hunting groups. Um, and it was pretty interesting results. Um, the, at that time, the wolf population numbered around 650. And the majority of the people who responded to that survey said that they were supportive of having that many wolves in the state. Okay. So there seems to be general, general support. The state kind of buried that document. You can't find it if you dig on the website, but it's marked draft to this day, and it'll forever be marked draft. Um, and there's, there's some interesting quirks in it, like they ask people about fear. You know, what's your fear factor? Uh, and like deer hunters were amongst the most fearful group in their responses there. And I, to this day, I can't figure out, was that because they, they really are afraid because they spent time in the woods or were they did they kind of know the right answer to give here to try to suggest this population should be low but uh, this um there's certainly been some major changes in attitudes happening over time you know and it's really interesting to me this most recent delisting proposal uh the attorney general from the state of michigan is opposed to it uh, the state of wisconsin which has been really pushing for delisting for a long time said that they support delisting Wisconsin wolves, but they did not actually say they support this general federal delisting proposal, which I think was a pretty remarkable step, actually. Uh, and, and the state of Minnesota's comments are basically kind of like, well, whatever you do, we're going to be able to deal with it. So it wasn't that strong. M Minnesota's in a little better place because wolves there are listed as threatened instead of endangered, and so they can do lethal depredation control, which we can't in Wisconsin or Michigan. And that's, you know... Personally speaking, that might not be a bad thing, 
the tribes, you know, begrudgingly accepted it. And if the Fish and Wildlife Service is really going to look at wolves on a national level, maybe, maybe it's appropriate for them to be listed threatened instead of endangered. So you could have some of those kinds of tools, but you wouldn't have general harvest seasons. I'm wondering, um, since you're not able to do lethal control in that area, are there compensation programs? Wisconsin, you know, it varies from state to state, but yeah, Wisconsin has a program. If you, um, if you think you've lost an animal to wolves, you call the APHIS staff who try to respond within 24 hours, and they're very good at that, and they will do an investigation and can look at, I, I have to say, I, I had the benefit, APHIS CCs me on all their investigations, so I kind of get to see the results of things. One thing, I, I didn't grow up in a livestock background. There's an awful lot of ways cows die. I mean, it's amazing. I've seen, I think like 10 days ago, I saw a lightning strike. But if you think you've had a loss, the APHIS staff will investigate and they'll do things like skin the animal out, they'll look for broken bones, the canine spacing. Uh, they can tell if an animal was, was stillborn and then scavenged versus, you know. And if it's determined that a wolf, you know, is the cause, you can be reimbursed by the state. If, if it was killed by a bear or a coyote, you're out of luck. But if it's killed by a wolf, you can get reimbursed. Um, and it, it, you know, it's curious. It can make some people happy. To me, again, looking at it from the Ojibwe perspective, you don't get this. Why do we always focus on the problems wolves cause instead of their benefits? I happen to grow up. I have four brothers myself, you know. And, yeah, we fought. We had problems. But that's not the nature of our relationship. But there are compensation programs. But they vary from state to state. And they're not perfect. You know, there's no doubt there's some people who lose animals legitimately and don't get reimbursed. But the same thing is true for hunting dogs in Wisconsin too. And that can be a big issue. One of the, the reason bear hunters in Wisconsin are really opposed to wolves is we have very liberal um, season. We, you're allowed to hunt bears with dogs. We have a very long training period over the summer months when wolves are at rendezvous sites with young pups. And if those bear dogs come through, they will oftentimes be killed. Okay. And the best place to run bear dogs is the big blocks of public land, which most people would argue the best wolf habitat in the state too. So it's, it's a difficult issue to address. Um, so the state of Colorado has a lot of recreation around the state. And I know Northern Wisconsin does too. And I was wondering if there was any effect, whether it's been positive or negative on just general recreation in the areas where wolves are present. Um, you know, I certainly, the fear factor comes in for some people. You know, I've had people say, you know, I'm afraid to drive out to the National Forest and take a hike, and I say the drive is the dangerous thing there. And fear is, fear is different than actual risk. You know, the risk can be very small, but if you're fearful, that's, that can be a real thing. Tourism kind of stuff hasn't really gotten big in Wisconsin because it's not easy to see wolves in our landscape. You know, in Yellowstone, that's a huge ticket. And I, I do run into hunters who say, boy, every time I go out in the woods, I see wolves and wolf sign. I go, if that's true, you should be taking, up, taking people out because people will spend big, you know, they'll spend big money to see that. Uh, and there is a little bit of that. I mean, people are happy to go out and see scat and tracks, um, but, it, but it's small scale at this point. Uh, and our landscape just doesn't make it very easy. We're just too wooded. When your wolves kind of repatriated themselves in Wisconsin, you probably had a pretty robust population just outside of it, I assume. Right, they were in northern Minnesota, and... We have this 200-mile gap between the Yellowstone ecosystem population and the northern border of Colorado, so, I mean, unless that, I mean, just as a crystal ball question, unless that southern half of Wyoming on the western side kind of gradually fills in, I assume it's going to take a really long time for any kind of repopulation. We've had the wanderers, but not... Right. Right. If if uh, if you are waiting for it to happen naturally, it yeah probably not going to be in my lifetime. Um, so there certainly could be ways you could speed that process up. But yeah. Mike. Have harvest rates for deer hunters changed over that trend line of increased wolf numbers? You know. Um, so the, like in Minnesota, if you look at, at how wolf numbers have trended there, wolf numbers tend to actually be, they tend to track deer numbers, okay? The deer numbers go up, then the wolf numbers can go up. 
And when the deer population falls, usually because of maybe two hard winters in a row or something like that, then the wolf numbers will fall too. You know, there'll be a lag. But, but deer numbers tend to drive wolf numbers rather than the other way around under normal situations. And, and right now, the last few years, actually under the, you know, the highest wolf numbers we've had in Wisconsin, wolf, deer numbers in northern Wisconsin have been on the uptick. So. The harvest rates from hunters. I would think that would be something they would look at. Yeah. More, wool, more wolves, like, we aren't getting as many, we aren't as successful. Right. I would get. I would have guessed that it would be impervious, like it wouldn't have any effect at all, but I'm wondering yeah. if they... And the people, yeah, on a landscape level, that's true, they haven't found evidence. But, look, you know, barroom biology tells you, you know, if I didn't see a deer this year, it's... And, you know, if it turns out that the place I've been hunting for 20 years is now in the middle of a wolf pack, I'm probably not going to have as good luck. But on a landscape level, it's... Uh, deer, deer harvest's pretty substantial in Wisconsin, and it has stayed that way. But it... Like in Minnesota, some of it went down at one point, but that's because the state was in actually intentionally driving the deer herd down. They, they felt they were over goals. Wisconsin, in recent years, has handed deer management off to the public, and the public pretty much just more deer, more deer, more deer. So. Well, I think we're out of time now, but I know Peter will be around for a few minutes afterwards if folks have more questions. But um, just want to thank Peter again for talking. Make which it was an honor. I, it really was. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you.